afternoon, evening, whenever you're watching this. Good morning, we're so glad you're here. Welcome to our house. And if you're in the watch party, go down in the chat and drop an emoji, say hi, introduce yourself. And that's also where you can submit prayer requests and answers to the questions from today's sermon. And students, you'll probably have to help your parents find it, like I always do, but that's okay. Um, and I'm also going to talk about a little bit what you can expect from today's sermon. Yes, we'll have announcements, we'll worship together, we'll have communion and offering, and then we're going to hear the latest message from Wayne in our current series, Epic. So now's a great time to get your Bibles, get your communion supplies, and let's worship together. Many of us have been watching the news, and we've seen the toll that this pandemic has taken on those on the front line. We're talking about first responders and healthcare workers. As a church, we know that it's not just the caregivers that are feeling the stress, but it's also their families. So we want to put an opportunity before you for you to be generous. We have an opportunity for you to give in three different ways for, to our families at Northeast who find themselves on the front line. Between now and next Saturday, April 25th, we ask that you consider partnering with us to help encourage those on the front line in one of three ways. First, you can write notes of encouragement. Second, you could send in money. And with that money, we're gonna buy gift cards to local restaurants to give to um, our families that are on the front line. And third, if you have any personal protective equipment that you can share, gloves, hand sanitizer, wipes, we will give that to people on the front line too. For more information on delivering these items, you can visit northeastcc.com slash care. That's northeastcc.com slash care. Now we're gonna move into our time of offering. In Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I know that's true for me because what I value is what I really care about. If I buy a house, I'm gonna take care of it. If I give money to my kids' education, I want them to value it and I want them to take it seriously. Where I put my money is where my heart follows. And in the same way, when we give our offerings to ministries or other things of eternal value, we're revealing what we really care about. We're responding to what God has done for us. We're showing what we think of God's gift of Jesus to us. If you want to respond to God by giving to Northeast, you can mail your checks to the church office, you can text, or you can sign up to give online. As we continue in our worship, let's take a moment to prepare our hearts and remember why we gather. Check out this video. It's based on Psalm 63, which affirms that everything we need is found in Jesus.
Does anybody else feel like 2020 has kind of taken a bad turn? This is not what I expected. This is not what we had planned. In fact, most of the things we had planned have either been canceled, postponed, or we don't know when they're gonna happen. Everything is up in the air and everything seems uncertain. But you know what one thing is certain? That's God's love for us. And in communion, we have this really unique opportunity to remember God's love for us in His Son, Jesus. We can rem remember, come together and remember His great sacrifice for us. So today, when you take communion, when you take your cracker, or your bread, your cookie, whatever it is, remember God's love for you and Jesus' body that was broken for you. And when you take your juice or your coffee or whatever you're using, remember Jesus' blood that was poured out for you.
Welcome. I'm glad you're with us today. I hope you've been encouraged so far. Uh, today we do want to celebrate a good, good father. Very important that we recognize how good he is, especially in this era in which we now live. We've been talking about the epic story of God. We've been talking about how the story of God started to unfold when he made us humankind in his own image. So it starts at creation where he creates us in his image and he wants us to reflect his image on earth. Well, we don't do a very good job of that and, the, and, and creation is broken because of it. And so he, he goes about a redemptive story with humankind where he wants to restore that image on earth. And he starts with the people and then he starts with the nation. And then it comes to a promise that he's given us that he's going to send one who's a perfected image of him, a Messiah, a chosen one who's going to make a way for us to be right again with him. And that's in the person of Jesus. We celebrated last week what Jesus did on the cross. On Good Friday, we celebrated what he did in paying the penalty for our sin and making a way for us to be right with God. And then on Easter, we celebrate the fact that he was uh, an overcomer of the grave and death, which gives us a confirmation that he did for us what we could not do for ourselves on Good Friday. So he is indeed a good father who loved us and was gracious and kind to us and sent his son for us. And now we live in this era, this in-between time, where Jesus has ascended to his Father, and we're told that he's going to ascend or return. He's going to descend. He's going to, he's going to come in the same way that he went. And so we live in this in-between time, and it's very important for us as we study this epic story to understand why. Why this era? Why this moment? You see, oftentimes... We take the story of God, this epic narrative of, of redemptive history, and we personalize it. I hear this a lot, where we take the, the, the story of God and we make it about us. And it is for us, but not just for us. So we, we, we say things like, Jesus died for me. That's true. The, the Father loves me. We want God's blessing for us. But it wasn't just about us. If, if, if we were to define the story, it's, it's not a timeline of history where there's creation and then there's these different eras we've been talking about through this epic story and then it comes to us and it, and it just kind of ends with us. The whole redemptive story of God wasn't about us. No, a, a, a better understanding of the timeline of God is that there's the creation and there's these different eras and now we're in an era and God wants to flow through us for the redemption of mankind. We get to be a part of the story. We get to be a part of what God's doing in this epic tale. This is where we find ourselves in the story. We're a part of it, but it doesn't end with us. And so it's really important for us to understand that he is a good, good father who desires other people to know that same truth. So it's really important that we own it. Today I'm going to be talking about some different texts. I'll be in John chapter 20. I'll be in Matthew chapter 28. Uh, talk a little bit about Acts chapter 1 and a little bit about Acts chapter 2 as well. And so if you have your Bibles, I want to encourage you to turn to John chapter 20. I'm going to read through that text and I'll kind of use that as my jumping off point today because in it is uh, a really good understanding of what God or what Jesus was doing at this time. And I want you to understand this. This is, this is the kind of a summary. If you were to look at the narratives after Jesus' resurrection and before his ascension into heaven, that 40 to 50 days is on earth, there's a very repetitive, very focused message that Jesus is telling his disciples. He's very focused. He doesn't come and say, look, I want you to live holy and righteous lives. I want you to, to clean yourselves up and live sin free. That's not what he says. He doesn't say, hey, I want you to now go back to your life and I'm going to bless you and you're going to be good and just go and acquire good things and it's all going to be good for you. He doesn't say that either. In every narrative, he focuses on mission and purpose. So if we could summarize, this is my point here. After the resurrection, Jesus was focused on mission and purpose. Every part of, of, of every story where he encounters his disciples, it's about making sure that they are focused on mission and purpose. So we want to talk about that today. Now in John chapter 20, when we find the disciples, the disciples aren't necessarily mission focused at this point. This is how the narrative reads, starting in verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you, and, and as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them, and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. Oh, sorry. Do my own text, so I'm, I'm behind. <laughs> sorry. Uh, if you, and he brings the Holy, gives, gives them the Holy Spirit. And then if you forgive anyone's uh, sins, then their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, then they're not forgiven. And I'll explain that in just a little bit because that can be a little confusing. You see, the disciples at this moment in history, the disciples are, they, they've seen Jesus suffer. They've seen him be arrested. That shook them. They had a confidence when he was when they were with Jesus. They'd seen the same Pharisees and Sadducees and Jewish leaders um, after Jesus all the time. But as long as they were with him, they seemed to have a boldness or a confidence. But as soon as Jesus was arrested, and as, as soon as they seen Jesus suffer, and, and when they saw Jesus die on a cross, and when they when they saw his body going into a tomb, it rattled them. And now we find them in a in a room together, with the door locked for fear of Jewish leaders. You see, if we don't believe with confidence that Jesus is alive, if we don't believe with confidence that we can know him and that he is operating very actively around us, if we think for some reason that he's passive, far away, dead, if we think that this this, this belief we have is, is really on kind of shaky ground as to whether we really believe it or not, we will have fear. Many of you probably experienced this when you had the opportunity to talk to someone about Jesus and and there's that part of you that really doesn't want people to ask. You really don't want to talk about it. It kind of scares you a little bit. You're scared of their reaction. You're scared of the same thing that the disciples would have been scared about. They were scared about uh, a, a blowback. They were scared about persecution, some maybe physical harm coming their way. They were afraid of the same mockery that Jesus faced. They were afraid of the humiliation of being associated with Jesus. We see that after Jesus was arrested. We see that after he was put to death. The disciples are fearful here. So here's Jesus then coming to appear amongst them, and he is going to change things. This is not the disciples. The characteristic we see of the disciples moving forward is not one of fear. It is not one of, of, of lack of mission focus or, or so scared that they didn't carry on. Matter of fact, these same guys are the, are the reason that you and I believe today. What they did, the message they carried, has impacted generation after generation. It's spread around the world because of what these guys did. So what does Jesus do to get them to understand and to believe in and have confidence in the mission and purpose that he has for them? What changes? Here's the challenge. The challenge for us today is how do we overcome fear that keeps us from our mission and our purpose? How do we overcome the same fear that we face and accept the mission and the purpose that Jesus has given to us? In this era of time, we have the exact same mission. In this era, when Jesus has ascended and the promise that he's going to return, we have this same mission. So how do we overcome our fear? That's what I want to talk about today. In John chapter 20, verse 19, it says, On the evening, first day of the week, when the disciples were together, the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. There is a fear of reprisal. And then something changes, and this is what changes. This is what compels the mission forward. What compels the mission is a belief that Jesus is alive. It's a confident hope. I talked about that last week. I talked about some of the, uh, the apologetics that kind of point to the fact that Jesus is really a factual thing. This really did happen. His resurrection did occur. But how is it that you and I can have that same confidence of knowing that this is real? I mean, his disciples had seen uh, his death. Some of them saw his resurrection and still, even, if, even after hearing testimony, had a hard time believing it. No, confidence comes when we believe with confidence that Jesus is alive. In John chapter 20, what Jesus does is it says he came and he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. So that's kind of freak them out probably a little bit. The door's locked. They're doing a head count and then suddenly there's an extra body in the room. Jesus stands among them and says, hey, peace be with you. And then he says, uh, it says he, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. There was a confirmation that Jesus was, this was him, and he was alive. And they're overjoyed. That confidence of knowing that he was alive caused a, a reaction of being overjoyed. They owned it in that moment. Like something changed, something shifted from fear to joy. In other passages of of the post-resurrection time in Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus invites his disciples to come meet with them on a mountain. 
It says the 11, they were, they were gathered, uh, the, the 11 were gathered together. They went to, to Galilee and to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but it says that some doubted. So when they saw Jesus, they worshiped him. When they, when they recognized him, they worshiped him. It says that some still doubt. Now, there is speculation among scholars what that means. If this is a doubt within the disciples or if this is doubt within the broader community of disciples, not just the 12 but you know, or the 11 that remain, but, but whether this is a broader understanding. But I think it's true for us that there are times that we see Jesus operate and it gives us confidence. But at the same time, maybe a week later we doubt. I know that's kind of my pattern. There's times that I believe with confidence and there's times that I seem to forget what I had confidence in the week before and, and now I doubt. And this was the same pattern the disciples had. It wasn't confidence all the time. But when they saw him, they were excited. When they saw him, they, they had confidence. But then they'd forget and they'd kind of doubt and we do the same thing. But when we believe that Jesus is solidly alive, when we believe that he's with us, there is belief and there's a compelling interest that we have when we recognize that he's alive and with us. In Acts chapter 1, there's another narrative, and this is uh, kind of a summary of the time in between uh, Jesus' resurrection and his ascension, a, a summary statement of what Jesus was about. And this is what it says. It says, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and he gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Recognize that. What Jesus was, was, was appearing to and, and giving people was a confidence. It was a, a convincing proof that he was alive. So he was appearing to his disciples saying, look, I'm alive. This was a confident thing that he wanted them to be confident about, that I'm alive. See, and he, it was, and he was proving himself to them over and over and over again as he appeared, just instilling this confidence that he was alive. And it happened over a period of 40 days. And he spoke about God's kingdom. I know for me, there are times, like I said, I, I forget, I, I lapse in my belief. I, but when I'm walking with him, when I'm meeting with him, when I'm solidly at his feet and I recognize what he's doing in my life, my confidence grows that he is alive and active with me. Many of you could give testimony and tale of, of what he's done in your life. Some of you asked for specific specific things and received a specific answer. There's been times that I've asked for things and specifics in a prayer, and I've gotten someone quoted back to me the specific thing I prayed about. There's been times when I've asked for God to resolve something, and, and I didn't see how it could clearly be resolved, but it, it resolves. There's times that I recognize His provision. There's, recognize, there's times I recognize Him overcoming a, a hardship or a... Or, or a uh, I, I feel at times a confidence in, in the way he instills a gifting in me. There are times that I see him confidently and I know that he's alive and active with me. And it gives me confidence to take on the mission and purpose that he has for my life. Do you believe that Jesus is alive? So what compels the mission? What helps us to overcome fear? What helped the disciples to overcome fear? The second thing that Jesus points to is that there needs to be a belief in the goodness of Jesus. We have to believe that what Jesus came to do was good, that we have a gracious Father who's good and He's kind, that in sending Jesus in the first place, it was good and it was good for us. When, when things were broken, when we sinned against God, He didn't take it out on us. He, he didn't um, require us to continue to make sacrifices and appease Him as an angry creator. Instead, he sends his son and he pays the price for us. I mean, what an incredibly gracious God, when his creation sins against him, he pays the price for it. Let that sink in for a moment, how good God is. And so Jesus in John chapter 20, when he's talking to his disciples, he says, uh, they're, they're, they're fearing, and, and he's allowed them to experience him, and they're overjoyed. And then he gives them this charge. He says, look, in the same way the Father sent me, now I am sending you in the same way. So if we believe that Jesus is good in, the, in his coming, that it was good, it was gracious, that he, he came for the first, the first time, if we recognize that, that he came for our good, then we have to believe that our being sent is also for good. 
It's for God's grace to flow through us. We've got to believe that. So many of us look at John chapter um, 3, verse 16 as, as a verse that we personalize. In this era of Christianity, we tend to take Bible verses and we own them for ourselves. For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his one and only son. And we often read it that for God so loved me that he gave Jesus and so that I can have redemption. But the fact is that God loves the world. He loves those who are with him. But he loves those who are far from him. He loves them all. And so when we think about this sending, that we're being sent in the same way that Jesus was sent, we could read this verse as this. For God so loved the world that he gave them you and me. For God so loved the world that he is sending us so that people would come to know Jesus and know eternal life and not perish for their sin. That is this era in which we live. This is the season in which God's grace wants to flow through us. We have to believe that Jesus is good and what he came to do was good. And now we've been given that same goodness, a good news to carry on. When we, um, in Acts chapter 1, we see another passage where Jesus is again gathering with his disciples. This is at his ascension. And before he departs, he says, look, this is going to happen. You're going to be my witnesses. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, your hometown. You're going to be in the region, in, in, in Judea and Samaria, and the ends of the earth. This is going to keep expanding. You're going to continue to be my witnesses. Now that word witness is the, the Hebrew word, or the Hebrew word, Greek word, is, is martyr. It, 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 it's what Later, we knew as martyrs, those who are witnesses that were put to death were called martyrs, and that word was used, the, the Greek word was used, and so it became known as martyrs. But it just means witnesses. The, the word means that they would give testimony to what they've personally seen and, and experienced. That's a, a witness, something that we've seen for ourselves. Like you and I have to recognize the goodness of God in our life. We have to recognize the goodness of Jesus Personally, we have to see it and experience it ourselves, and then talk about it. When we're excited about something, we like to talk about it. Uh, you can scroll through Facebook and you see people who are celebrating events and they're excited about it. And so it's anniversaries and it's, it's weddings and it's graduations and it's uh, first walks and it's first words and all the things that you see celebrated. When I've come across a, a, a deal, it was just like two, two days ago, three days ago, whatever, we were in the... Uh, club. We call it the club. That's what our kids called one of the wholesale clubs. And they had toilet paper. They had a lot of it. I got kind of excited. I got so excited. I almost thought about texting some people, telling them why. Because I was excited. I was excited about something. Like there's, whenever we're excited about something, we want to tell them about it. I know it's stupid. It's toilet paper. But the point is that when we're excited about something, we want to tell. When I find something that I, that I want everyone to know about, I just, I want to tell. I want to share it. I in those moments of excitement, when I experience Jesus for myself, when I recognize his goodness, got to be compelled to share that. I've got to be ready to share that as much as I would a wedding memory or an anniversary memory, the goodness of of Jesus in my life. That is being a witness. So here's a question. Here's what I want to leave you with just for this this section. I'm going to ask you to, to think about this and ponder this question. What has he done for you? I mean, what is... What's changed in you? Where have you seen the goodness of Jesus in your life? So here's the specific question. How have you experienced the goodness of Jesus to such a degree that you have to share it? Think about that for just a few minutes.
what compels the mission forward, what allows us to overcome fear, what allowed the disciples to overcome their fear. Well, Jesus points to this promise that there's the power of, of God's presence in us. Now, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. Jesus, in every one of these narratives post-resurrection, talks about the mission or the purpose that he's giving them, and then he talks about the promise of his presence and the presence of the Holy Spirit or his personal presence. In the Old Testament, we see that the Holy Spirit was present at time. There, at times, there, there, the, the Holy Spirit would appear and come on people, and in those moments, those occasions, there was really powerful things that happened, but not everyone had the Holy Spirit. The Spirit was kind of given and taken, and the Spirit would appear. And, and we now live in this era, this age, where the promise of the Holy Spirit has come. The Holy Spirit is God's presence living in us. And this is what compels us in this mission. This is what allows us to overcome our fear or uh, basically allows this power to flow through us for the sake of this mission. We have to believe that just like we see in the Old Testament, when the Holy Spirit was present, powerful things occur, that powerful things will happen in us and through us with the Holy Spirit's help. It's not about us. It's about the Holy Spirit wanting to flow through us. In John chapter um, 20, when Jesus is talking again with his disciples. He says that he appears and he shows them his side and, and his hands and they're overjoyed. And then he says, uh, it says, and with, with that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now this did not mean that the disciples were given the ability to absolve sin. It just meant what Jesus is saying, look, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a, a taste of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to give you a Holy Spirit light, whole, the advanced copy of the Holy Spirit. And when you extend grace, people can be forgiven. But if you withhold grace, people can't be forgiven. In other words, it wasn't the, the, the power of the disciples withholding grace. It's the fact that they wouldn't tell people about Jesus. You and I have that same power. If we don't extend the grace of God by telling people how they can be forgiven, then how are they ever going to be forgiven? So when we uh, forgive people's sin, when we extend grace, then grace can be found. But when we withhold it, grace cannot be found. And so it's the Holy Spirit that allows this in us to continue to share and to forgive and to share the goodness and the grace of God. In Matthew chapter 28, Jesus, after giving the Great Commission, he says this, And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Again, it's the commissioning to go and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be with you to the very end of the age. I'm going to be present with you. That compels that mission forward. In Acts chapter 1, when Jesus is again appearing with his disciples before his ascension, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and then you're going to be my witnesses. It's, again, the promise of God's presence in us. I'm going to talk more about this next week, about what the Holy Spirit does, but know that when it comes to the mission and the purpose that we've been given, the commissioning we've been given as disciples of Jesus, the Holy Spirit compels that mission forward. He empowers it and He enables it. And we see it in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, the disciples receive the Holy Spirit. There's a the day of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit comes. It says it's, it's the sound of, of wind, and it appears like tongues of fire. And, and the Holy Spirit comes, and, and people are able to hear. All these people that are gathered are able to hear in their own tongue uh, about Jesus. They're able to hear a message. And Peter, who's a simple fisherman, he stands up, and he's suddenly not fearful anymore. He is now bold. And he's not afraid of, of, of the Jewish leaders. Now he's going to speak boldly to all those who are in Jerusalem. And, and, and he's going to speak to them. And he's going to speak a very compelling and convicting message. And he talks to them about who Jesus was and the fact that they, they crucified Jesus. And it says that they were cut to the heart. And it wasn't Peter's words or his, his ability to craft those words that brought that power in his words. It was the presence of the Holy Spirit now in him that brought the power through him. When the Spirit convicts and people are cut to the heart and they're repentant and they're desiring, what do we need to do to be different? What do we need to be right with God? That is the power of the, the Holy Spirit's presence in us when we're operating and moving through it. He will enable the mission to move forward. 
Well, let me lead you with this. There's an urgency in this era. Not only do we have to believe that Jesus is indeed alive, we have to recognize his goodness, and we have to recognize that he's been, that God now dwells in us. There's nothing we can't do with the power of the Holy Spirit. This mission will prevail. But there's an urgency to this era. In Acts chapter 1, when Jesus ascends, his disciples are there and they, they receive this charge to be witnesses. And then Jesus ascends into heaven and he goes up into the clouds and he disappears into the clouds. And this is what it says. It says, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. And they were looking intently into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white were beside them. So suddenly these, these angelic figures appear next to them. And this is what the angelic figures say. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? In other words, this isn't what you were made to do. This isn't the era that you need to be doing this. In other words, don't, don't, don't just stand there and look up. Don't just stand there and, and gaze. Don't just stand there. This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Man, that's our charge. That gives us this urgency to this message that there is a day that you and I are going to see him ascend. There is a day when, the, when he'll come in the same way he left. And it's at that time that, that all those are his will be called to him. And it's our mission now in this era to make sure that as many people as possible know the goodness of God and how much he loves them. That's our mission. I pray that you've been encouraged today. I'm going to pray for us as we go. Lord, I thank you so much. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for confirming and affirming for us that you are indeed alive in the way that you work in our life. Thank you for the transformation that we feel and that we experience with you. Thank you for being very real to us. And Lord, I, I thank you that you've affirmed for us the goodness of who you are, the goodness of what you came to do, the grace and the love shared to us. And I pray that we wouldn't hold that as our own, that we wouldn't claim that love and that grace as something exclusive for us, that we would pronounce judgment on everybody else that we don't deem worthy of your love. Rather, Lord, I pray that we would take on this mission, recognizing that you have placed yourself, the power of your spirit in us, and that you want to flow through us so that men would come to know you. Lord, thank you for this urgency that we now live in this era, this time, where we get to carry this goodness to the world. Thank you for including us in the story, this epic story. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I hope you've been encouraged today. We do believe that God desires to move, especially right now. It's in these moments where we feel vulnerable. It's in this season that we're in right now, this time, this weird time where people feel very vulnerable. And it's in these moments that they're very open to what God has for them. I pray that you would be thinking and praying about who you might encourage, who has God placed in your life that he wants to extend his grace to, and and he's sending you to be the spokesperson, to be Jesus. Think about that, pray about that. I also want to encourage you to participate in the chat that's still going on. Help us to know how we can encourage you. If there's ways we can pray for you, please put that in the chat. If there's ways we can help you, please let us know. We have a prayer team ready to go. We have people ready to respond to those who need help. So don't hesitate to ask. God bless you guys. Have a great day.